On May 10, 1994, Nelson Mandela was democratically elected as South Africa's first black president. It was a victory for black South Africans, and for the first time in a long time, a new sense of hope emerged. This sense of hope was not always present. For just a few short decades ago, laws were put into place to ensure segregation and white dominance, which formally established into apartheid, a legislative system that took away the individual rights of non-white citizens. Through this documentary, I will illustrate how black South Africans protected their natural rights from apartheid laws through riots and campaigns in the 1950s, and ultimately forced South Africa's parliamentary government to change their legislative system for a more stable society. It all began during the diamond rush in 1866. At the time, opportunities for decent wages were low. White miners petitioned the Dutch government to purposely discriminate black miners through legislation to ensure higher wages. Under these new prejudice laws, the black miners were given significantly less mining opportunities and liberties. Poverty was intensified with the enactment of the Natives Land Act in 1913, which prohibited black South Africans from buying, lending, or leasing land, and was intended to keep them as menial workers. As a result of this law, only 7% of the land was owned by black South Africans, and Afrikaans hoped they could profit. In 1948, the Afrikaner National Party, composed of Dutch people, gained power in the South African government. Their rise to power led to the official legislative enactment known as Grand Apartheid. This segregation system is literally translated to mean state of being apart. This new scheme limited social and political rights, as well as minimized educational and economic opportunities for colored people. A.L. Geyer, an apartheid supporter, states that while there seems to be two possible lines of development, apartheid or partnership, partnership meaning cooperation of individual citizens within a single community, irrespective of race, the Afrikaner Dutch ultimately chose the enactment of apartheid because in order to self-preserve their race and maintain white dominance, they aimed to manufacture a system that deprived black South Africans of fundamental rights and economic opportunities instead of working together to push them down. These laws sparked mass public outrage, especially the Population Registration Act of 1950. This law required each South African to be racially classified and labeled into three groups, white, black, or colored, and would influence their way of living. That served as a prototype for the Group Areas Act of 1951. Under this law, urban areas were racially divided into different zones. The zones that non-white South Africans were forced to live in were typically areas that were underdeveloped and further away from the industrial cities, and therefore were, there were less job opportunities. As the list of apartheid legislation grew, so did the anger among the non-white South Africans. The ANC, also known as the African National Congress, took responsibility to protect oppressed South African people, uniting all Africans together to fight discrimination laws by peaceful protests. Nelson Mandela, Walter Sisulu, and Oliver Tambo introduced a defiance campaign of 1950. This mass movement purposely broke apartheid laws to express their resentment towards apartheid. For instance, non-Europeans would walk into Europeans-only areas. By forming resistance, they hoped the government would contemplate reform due to constant uprising. Demonstrations against the South African government's strict apartheid policies flare into shocking violence. At Sharpsville, an industrial township, thousands gather outside a police station in protest against new laws requiring every African to carry a pass at all times. The crowd refused to disperse and began stoning the police, who opened fire into the crowd from behind a wire fence. In two days of demonstrations that began here, between 50 and 100 were killed and hundreds injured. Worldwide protests were raised, including a condemnation of the violence by the United States State Department. In South Africa, a mass work boycott by Africans is crippling industry in the area. An uneasy calm reigns. The conditions that led to the Sharpsville tragedy continue unchanged. The Africans require, want to franchise on the basis of one man, one vote. They want political independence. Their upheavals create a major instability within the South African nation in which they anticipated would provoke revolution. One of the major protests anchored towards the racial past book led to the Sharpsville massacre. So on March 20th, 1960 near Johannesburg, hundreds of people showed up without their passbooks. The police panicked and began shooting into the crowd, killing 69 people and wounding 186. 
The government still didn't reconsider reform after this flustering event. However, this event was successful in increasing international attention of more powerful organizations, which would gratefully influence opinions of the government. Many other voices arose during this period to fight for human rights, as did the number of deaths and arrests because apartheid caused instability. Between 1960 and 1980, there were over 2 million law convictions, according to the Black Sash, who was a white liberal women's human rights activist group. Students also fought hardships in school due to apartheid. The Afrikaans Medium Decree of 1974 forced all black schools to use Afrikaans in English instead of their native tongue and prevented them from academic improvement. Sasso, a student organization led by Stephen Biko, fought to make sure the government wouldn't obstruct the education experience they cherished. And of course, we desire education, and we think it's a good thing. But uh, you don't have to have education in order to know that uh, you want certain fundamental rights, so you have got aspirations, you have got uh, claims. 4,000 people have been killed by police confrontations. The government remained in a state of emergency and by the end of the year have arrested 22,000 people and censored media coverage. In the 1980s, it was complete chaos. Luckily, due to increased attention from riots, international influences took responsibility by using their power to help abandon apartheid. By 1973, the United Nations condemned apartheid and declared it a crime against humanity, challenging the South African government. The General Assembly called upon nations to boycott South African goods, which would show the South African government that they are displeased, forcing their government to reconsider what was more important, apartheid or a prosperous economy, and it was a major step to disassembling the apartheid system. International sanctions also had a powerful effect on South Africa. The U.S. sanction of 1986 requested many modifications be made to South Africa's nation, like changing its political system for the better of world harmony. Another request was to release activist leaders like Nelson Mandela. In 1990, Frederick de Klerk, the new South African president, released Mandela due to international and national pressure, and his release signified a major step towards equality. Clark was willing to negotiate with the ANC, which was a major shift in governmental position. In 1994, South Africa held its first truly democratic elections. The African National Congress won 63% of the vote. Its leader, Nelson Mandela, became president of South Africa's first multiracial democracy. The people of South Africa have spoken in this election. They want change. And change is the ANC takes have. responsibility and realizes it needs to achieve a foundation of human rights and justice for stability. They target to achieve a non-racist, non-sexist, united democratic society based on the Freedom Charter. Its reconstruction policies will allow population groups to coexist peacefully, exterminating traces of violence, prejudice, and injustice. So far, the new governmental system has created an environment that allows economic and political growth to overcome poverty and influence equality. They're able to conduct free and fair elections, which is a peaceful transfer of power. The ANC also works to return everybody's natural rights, but also ensure a fair judicial system. This is just one of many solutions to repair the wounds from apartheid. The Reconstruction and Development Program also aims to redistribute land back to owners, build homes in cities, create a transport system, and set up cleaner living conditions like clean water and electricity. With activities that involve the whole community, it gives the opportunity for everyone to not only repair their relationships with other races, but an opportunity to repair the outlook of South Africa. The abandonment of apartheid has brought great change and is very likely to continue to grow and mold a successful future for the next generations. The past will always be a reminder of the instability apartheid caused. At the time when that was happening in South Africa, I, it was so hard to think of people being oppressed or people not having the opportunities that we kind of sometimes take for granted. You know, in South Africa, you couldn't decide where you could live. You know, you were forced to live in a black township. You couldn't just suddenly go, you know what, I think Salmon Creek is kind of cooler than that. Before and during the period of apartheid, black South Africans were restricted from their individual rights, so they protested. Peace has been brought upon the South African nation thanks to the persistence and determination of powerful activists, international influences, and most importantly, the people who never stopped trying. It was a major struggle, but today South Africa continues on a path to a fair, steady, and prosperous society.